the first things I like to test are media and headlines. Those are your, your biggest pushers. Um, you know, test images. I love image ads. Um, I know that everyone's like video, video, video. And I, we run a ton of videos. We're here making videos. Um, but I still love image ads. I, they're my favorite. I can always get them to just crush. And so I like to test the media and the headlines. The reason I like those two things is because they're the biggest levers you can pull. Um, I've had ads that were doing okay. I changed the image. They started doing well. I wrote the right headline and boom. Like I was, I was on a, I was on a consulting call the other day for this guy. And, uh, three days later, I, I, I was making some ads for him at the end just to test. Right. And I wrote this headline. Um, and it, it you know, I, it just came off the cuff, whatever. Didn't think anything of it. Sent it. Consulting call ended. We, three days later, he goes, dude, I, it really bothers me how that thing you put up in the past five minutes is our best performing ad we've ever had. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. I am here on the road, actually in Kelowna, British Columbia, visiting Jason Krisky at Straw House. Uh, but today my guest is Jordan Menard. So you guys all know Jordan Menard. A lot of people know Jordan Menard. Uh, he is the engine, the media buying, the media buying strategy and the actual media buying engine behind some of the biggest names in info. Uh, he's currently working with Mark Lack, but he's also worked uh, with Sam Ovens, consulting.com. Uh, he's an interesting story. We had him speak in Las Vegas and he blew everyone away uh, and he was one of the best speakers there. And so we we're like, okay, we got to squeeze him in in San Diego, which is his hometown. So we get him on in San Diego. He, uh, he burned the house down in San Diego as well. And then we, so he's the only speaker. He's also going to be in Barcelona, obviously, but he's the only speaker, I think, who's except for Tim Bird, uh, who's going to be at all three of our events. He's just a must have. Uh, he's a must have person to party with as well, uh, which is another reason he's here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about <laughs> some of the things that came out of F8, the Facebook conference, as yeah. well as the future of info marketing as he sees it. Welcome to the Robust Marketer. Jordan, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's great to be back. I love doing these shows with you. And uh, man, I'm so excited for Barcelona. It is going to be an unbelievable amount of fun. Yeah, it always it always is. So uh, basically, you know, today we're here to talk about info. We're here to talk about some amazing things. Uh, what, you know, I think people know your story. I think we covered that last time. You're pretty, you're a known commodity in the space. Um, so what's on your mind right now, uh, in this world of, of, of media buying and, and, and basically your focus at this point is pretty much hundred percent info, right? Um, not hundred percent. We also focus on subscription models. Um, but I would say that's where my mind's at uh, right now in the game. Um, I think uh, it's pretty obvious that the days of sending cold traffic directly to a product page and it really working out for you are kind of, if not over, at least numbered. And um, I see a lot of people making the smart move to really go after the strength of the content play, um, really focusing on providing really good, relevant content. Uh, either in a video view campaign or uh, some type of engagement campaign, and then uh, remarketing to those people with a product pitch, even for straight sale e-com. Um, I'm starting to become of the opinion that the real money in this industry and the only way to have long-term success um, outside of info products, uh, which I think there's a lot of success in, uh, would be the subscription model because it gives you that recurring revenue. And uh, as CPMs continue to go up and front end metrics continue to increase, um, it seems like the only way to really back out is to not just have that uh, one single pop, but uh, you know, several, uh, maybe four or five to increase that uh, LTV. Exactly. Well, I just want to give everyone a reminder who's watching live that this is a live stream. We're doing this right now. Uh, this is only, real. This is really yeah. happening. So if you have questions, you know, Jordan is one of the most insightful media buyers on the planet. So you have specific questions, not, not even related to what we're talking about feel free to drop them in the uh, in the comments or the questions and we will address them as we go um okay so first of all you tuned in for f8 when was f8 was like right. a month ago now um it was a few weeks ago i think yeah I, I, I don't know maybe a month i'm, I'm not sure and what was some of the, yeah so what were some of the main insights you gleaned from that well there's um you know there's a lot of things going on i i think you know, it was almost ironic when Mark Zuckerberg gets out there and he's like, we're taking privacy very seriously. And like everyone kind of laughed at him. But you got to remember, at the end of the day, he's got to appease shareholders. And the pressure is on on Facebook to improve uh, everything they can to make users happy. 
they're, I kind of see them in a catch-22 there because they're going to do things that appeal to people who don't even understand how they work. They just like have like a, a mass public appeal. And who that affects most are uh, their most devoted user base and advertisers. Um, so there's going to be like a lot of changes. I don't know um, how much of you saw it, but it looks like uh, they're making a lot of changes to, they're like for uh, a, lot, a lot of changes on like how the app functions from a like focal standpoint, right? So right now, um, and specifically a while ago before Facebook made that update, uh, everything was focused on like how popular the content was and how authoritative the source was. Um, and the, the likes and engagement numbers were super crucial. Um, Instagram is rolling out, they announced in F8, a, um, a, you know, a test basically in Canada where they're gonna start hiding the amount of engagement and likes on the post. So only the person that posted it can see it. And I think that's kind of emblematic of like the general move by the networks to push towards the focus being on content as opposed to the focus being on popularity. And so I think that affects advertisers in a lot of ways, right? Um, so often we, we love to go for massive amounts of exposure and um, in, increasing that frequency and, and you know reaching millions of people. But I think that we're, we're prone to forget how powerful a good piece of content can be, especially when utilized right and then fed into all of the, the technical stuff that media buyers do. And so I, I see a lot of things in F8 going on with uh, that same thing. Uh, they also announced that they're gonna look at some, uh, some of the speech that people are using um, and warn users if they're saying something that could be like possibly offensive and maybe suggest that they not put that content through. Yeah, which I found very big brother, like very- Dark crime, baby. Yeah, right? And you know, I just thought, you know, I understand that they have very advanced uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that can you know figure that stuff out. But at the same time, that's it's a very posi scary position to be in. And I see massive blowback if they really roll that out. Um, I think the biggest thing to take away from the conference was like, there is just an immense amount of changes coming. Obviously as advertisers, we all know the, the fourth CBO is coming in September. And it seems like um, they're really trying to push the platform in a direction where um, they shake the, the negative press, but also kind of like pave a new frontier. Um, you know, uh, there was uh, completely different UIs that came out for Facebook. Um, Instagram's launching one as well. They went to a very minimalist, all white, very smooth. Um, I have it on my mobile app. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's interesting to see changes are definitely coming. That's super. Yeah, I've been experiencing the, the Instagram rollout with the, uh, uh, with, you know, not showing the, the total like numbers. And it's, I, right. do, I think part of that was for maybe for that idea of like anxiety that people get from social media. Uh, to try to diminish that sort of like social game a little bit of like liking things yeah. because other things are liked. Like it's really interesting to, to look at the subtle changes they're making uh, when they're when they're right. such a behemoth. They're such a huge, huge company with so much like actual mental impact on people on a daily basis. So they really it, it's it, it's going to be interesting to see how they evolve and how they change and how that affects both advertisers and the the world at large. So and in the general narrative of like being good for people, right? Like Mark Zuckerberg has constantly maintained that the vision of Facebook is to help the world, but now they're becoming at a position where it's like the general psychological well-being of their users is at conflict with the interests of their shareholders, at least it appears that way, and it's interesting to see how they react, you know. That's nuts. This the the sort of I don't want to get too deep down the thought crime rabbit hole, but Super interesting. I was looking at uh, the new Microsoft Office suite as well, and it does the same thing. As you type, it'll suggest maybe you want to use a gender neutral expression here, or right, maybe right. you want to be more exclusive in this language or whatever, mm -hmm. which is which is interesting, which, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see the way that goes with like how we as a culture decide, you know, what's better for the world, whether it's whether we have to change the way we think uh, or. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting because technology is bringing up a lot of like classical ideological debates that were seemingly shelved for a while. And now these networks are bringing these classic debates back of like, you know, how do you keep a community safe? What role does language play? And when does it cross the line into an action or an incitement? Um, it, it's really interesting to see these networks that started off as like, can you check if someone in this college is single? is now grappling with these like very intense, like fundamental freedom issues. Yeah, well, we're not here to talk about that. We'll talk about that in Barcelona over a few drinks. Right, uh, <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, we'll, go down, we'll go down every rabbit hole while there. But let's, uh -huh. let's, first of all, tell me where you are right now. 
So I'm at my client, uh, Mark Lack's house. It's uh, up in uh, the Laguna Beach area. Um, you can hear the waterfalls running nicely in the background. Um, Mark has been um, a, a client uh, from, of mine for since I started the agency. Um, we have a very boutique agency. Um, we're actually not even accepting clients right now, um, but we've been working with Mark for a long time. Um, we've been building, I, I've accepted the long-term nature of this game. <laughs> I understand you have to work hard uh, and profits oftentimes will come three months from the work you put in today or sometimes longer. And so um, we're, we've finally built up a very strong infrastructure and um, we've been waiting for this day for a long time. And so it's nice to come here and uh, we're filming videos all day, we're making ads and um, we're crafting a couple new offers and uh, launching a few new remarketing assets that are going to be pretty exciting. That's awesome. Now we don't need to re like, it's funny. I, I don't think it's, I'm in info marketing, obviously. Uh, and uh, all of, a lot of us are to some extent. So every single one of my YouTube ads is is an info marketer. And I imagine right. most people's are at this point because it's such an effective form of marketing. There's so many people with different takes on it. I, I, I know, like, I remember talking with Jeremy Haynes and, and he, we were talking about like whether it was saturated, I guess, like the six months ago when we talked about it. And mm -hmm. he talked about how uh, it's kind of impossible to saturate just because there's so many people that have so many different skills and so many people want to learn so many different skills. Like info yeah. is nearly unlimited. So the chances of it becoming truly saturated are are, are rough. What do, what do you think about the saturation of info right now? Yeah, so J Jeremy's a really smart guy. Um, I, I worked with him um, uh, on the Dan Lot campaigns. Uh, they brought me on as a consultant. Um, so Jeremy's a really, a really strategic guy. So I, I, I agree with him. I think that um, you know this, this is kind of like the thing that um, you know it, it's a big ocean. You know what I mean? I think that the too saturated is less likely than the barrier to entry becoming higher to get good at this game. I've noticed that the days of just sending cold traffic to a webinar and it converting at a decent clip are pretty much gone. You have to come up with a much more uh, sophisticated and uh, meticulously planned and budgeted uh, strategy in order to do something that can scale with stability. And so I'm of the opinion that um, as the info market does become more saturated, not to a point where I think we'll, we'll reach any substantial level of saturation, it just becomes harder for like the clowns and the people who have um bad offers and bad products to really get through that market and people will do what they always do which is like oh facebook doesn't work anymore it's like no bro it's just the game has changed and it requires a much different level of commitment now that's interesting so most people i feel like work from a from a playbook almost like the rust like i don't know if it's the russell brunson playbook i'm sure there are other playbooks offer launches and things like that that were really all about getting you know get you know getting people in on a lead magnet getting them through to a right. webinar, taking every right. possible care to make sure they show up to that webinar, making sure that after they, they register for the webinar, there's a video that hooks them into right. having to be at that webinar. Right. So this is like the traditional playbook through to the webinar, through to the sale, through to the remarketing. And and I, so, so people that are operating from this old, this sort of like existing playbook, can you still make that work? Or do you really need to be playing jazz and like figuring out more right. innovative things? Right. So work is uh, work's a relative term, right? Uh, could you get that profitable at 50 a day? Like, I don't know, probably. Um, could you make 10,000 a month doing that? Um, probably. Um, w would it be something that I would say, hey, this, like, if I were to, if I had to bet money on that strategy, would I put any substantial backing behind it? Um, no, I would not. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Facebook's, I, I'm sure everyone on this, uh, watching this has probably noticed that Facebook's compliance has been uh, on steroids recently. They are crack. I've had ads running for a long time and they're getting, uh, disapproved while active. And it's like, dude, this ad has over 2 million impressions. What do you mean that it's like not, you know, you guys have been serving it for a month and a half. So there's definitely like this compliance, um, shift. And I think that's emblematic again. It, it's demonstrative of these big changes that are happening on platform. I think one of them is Facebook is looking at people's content in a much more um, meaningful way. They, they think that the strength of the content is going to be important. And so when I look at my info businesses, um, we, again, I run a boutique agency and then we're also bringing an internal product uh, eventually to the market. And, um, you know, when, when I run those things, I, 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 we never even look at that as an, a legitimate strategy. Um, if anything, we've been noticing that webinars seem to be in retrograde. Um, mm. The popularity of them, they, they spiked enormously uh, in the past few months. I think the market reached saturation. I think um, so many people started these free trainings, which is really just a sales pitch. And it's like, 
people now they're like that's not a free training you know um i think it's kind of like created that 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 type of saturation in the in the the content market that forces you to think outside the box i've noticed in all of my campaigns across the board all of my because we don't we don't just do the buying or the ad writing or we do all of that but we also do all the funnel development uh conversion rate optimization and we actually tell our business partners like hey you need we need to make this wing to you know and so what I've noticed is that when I've been going outside the box and trying things that I believe will work because I see the value in it, um, we've been seeing a lot of success. Um, we actually switched one of our clients from a webinar to a VSL and now it's crushing. So I, I would say looking at that simple, well, hey, this is what you do. Um, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, and I, I think uh, it's, it's really uh, the market's going to reward people that are innovative. Very cool. Now, now, one of the things I like about you is I think you're, uh, well, first of all, we'll get to that in a second. We've got a couple of great comments here. They're just comments so far. No good questions. John Billima, hey, John, says the machines are rising. Connor Peterson gives us mad shout out saying that this live is big time fire. You got Luca just like telling other people you got to get on here. And Vito Glazers thinks that webinars in retrograde is like, I think it might be the name of my new post-punk band. So I think, uh, I think well, that's, that's really good. Well, Vito has the PR connections to make that album go platinum. So that's fantastic. I, I want, I, I want, I want producer creds, Vito. Okay, we'll make sure he gives you those. So Jordan is one of those rare unicorn type type marketers who has an incredibly creative mind. You should hear the guy freestyle; it's literally mind blowing. <laughs> uh, and but he also is super dialed in on metrics. And one of the things we talk a lot about, like if you're a if you're marketing ecom or you're an agency. Um, info in a lot of ways is like the ultimate product. A because it has such local, such such low. You know, there's there's no real cost to it once you start selling it. Once you build out right. your funnels, right? Um, but it's also super tricky. Talk a little bit about the metrics and the mind for metrics oh, that you sort man. of develop for info. That could be the yeah. whole talk for day. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it, it's pretty it's pretty interesting because uh, a lot of people look at info as like uh, they think it's easy because you don't have physical inventory. Um, what people also don't realize is that if you don't have physical inventory and you are making a transaction happen, the customer is going to take that into account, right? So, um, being, being an info, I think, and it's something I tell a lot of people on my team and a lot of people I work with is if you can buy info products, you can buy anything because the sale doesn't happen when the first conversion does. That is the crucial thing, right? So on one of, one of my clients, uh, speaking of metrics, one of the things I really became interested in is how long from the first time they land on our webinar page to the point that they close the sale is the average time period for all of my customers. And I found out it was 10.8 hours. That was like the, it, it, the average minimum, I'm going to wait 10.8 hours. I was, that's a long window. So it's very difficult to optimize when you're buying things that, uh, that are, you know, the, they're not only is the attribution inherently delayed on platform, but you know, the purchase doesn't actually come until 10 hours after uh, the, you know, the, the webinar registration or whatever it is. And so the metrics there, and, and that's why I say it's so difficult. The metrics there become everything. Um, when you're scaling webinars and I, I think if you're scaling any, any type of uh, product at all, I can tell you the only way to do that is to launch an unbelievable amount of ads. You have to launch ads every single day, like literally every day. And when you do that, you start to have to look at the metrics and read them in a way that, um, there you can make, uh, insightful, like, uh, actions but nothing has even happened yet at that scale. You know, let's say you launch an $8,000 campaign and you have 10 hour windows to purchase. What metrics are you going to look at to determine if that should be paused, you know? And so uh, you have to start going up the funnel and start to recognize patterns. And that's a lot of what it is recognizing patterns in the data. Like, okay, so somebody landed on the VSL and, and that cost us a dollar 80. They registered for the free training and that cost us $7. We know that that's $2 below the first KPI of what we're looking for for a registration cost. They then uh, stay till the, they see the call to action. We have the pixel fire after a certain amount of time they've been on the page. So we know that the price was shown to them. 
that comes in at $83. Now we're, we see we got a problem because we know we want that uh, CTA number to be $75. So we're watching that, right? Now, nothing's even happened. We're just, okay, the, pre the initial KPIs and predictive metrics are warning us this may not be very hot. You know what I mean? And then we start to see people going through and it's like, okay, the initiated checkout cost is uh, 220. Oh, that's significantly over the 180 we need. And even worse, we're starting to see a bigger gap come as we go down the funnel. We're gonna give this campaign an hour before we, we pause it. Um, understanding the data, selecting your dashboards right and picking out what metrics are significant and what metrics are, uh, they're just mirage, you know? Uh, the signal vanity the metrics. Yeah, vanity metrics. Right. Uh, that those things are so crucial. They're so crucial. Um, one of the things that we you know we look at heavily are um, you know are we seeing uh, initiate checkouts that are indicating this this will be uh, this will be profitable from three days from now. You know what I mean. So you have to look at the volume. You have to look at you know a, a lot of things and how many of those are converting and and stuff like that to really really run those. It all comes down to finding um, what KPIs are truly indicative of sales, and that comes through pattern recognition. And and so then people that are using a blueprint that they got from someone else and just sort of leaving it up, being okay, I know the blueprint, I know my yeah, I know my info, and just throwing it out there, but not knowing the skeleton, not knowing how to actually like read the, the important metrics because once you can do that that's when you can play jazz right, right and that's when you right. can take that's when you can even take the the formula of, of how to do this and, and and play jazz with it and you and then you'll know where along that process just like just like any good marketer will know yeah. where things are breaking down and then what has to change but you have to be creative enough to be able to know how to pivot to improve those metrics that's so true and the more creativity you bring into it the more funnel leaks you create as you create more um, creative entrances, remarketing assets, you're going to find that breaks other things. And looking at the account, the offer, the business as an ecosystem that functions in a, a, a you know social framework is is crucial to understanding why we set these things up the way we did and what they're supposed to tell us. Let's talk a little bit about create. I want to get into CBO. We're going to talk about CBO in a little bit. I've heard a lot of different things about that. Uh, sure. I'm using it myself right now, um, okay. but I want to talk. What you said about, about the amount of creatives that you're testing on a daily basis. Yeah. Talk a little bit about like your structure for testing creatives, and and like you know how many creatives do you have in an ad set. How do you, how often how aggressive are you with killing them? And you're sure. saying you want to create a ton of creatives. You Great can't question. have too many if your budget's too small, right? Great you got you got to give them each yeah. each a, a significant test. Yeah. So uh, this is a great question. Um, so uh, I love dynamic creative um, as a testing mechanism. I would say that is that has cut my my front end uh, testing cost by about like 15, 20 percent um, a lot. Um, so I like to uh, I like to organize everything by angle. So if it's info products uh, or it's physical products, I'm typically going to organize the at the campaign level, put the product or the angle um, if the, the, you know, the, the overall ad angle that at the ad set level, that's where I use what ad sets are for audiences, bids, budgets, schedules, uh, you know, whatever it is like that, optimization windows. And then at the ad level, um, let's say I have a brand new angle I want to test. I'm typically going to put a lifetime CBO uh, with dynamic creative or uh, just ad set level lifetime, either one uh, with dynamic creative. And I like to keep the amount of permutations possible approximate with the amount of conversions I would get with my budget. So I know that was complicated. Let me explain it like this. Let's say I have, uh, you know, two images and a video and three headlines. That's 15 possible combinations right there. Right. So I want to keep, you know, some type of, if I have 15 possible combinations, how many conversions can each one of those permutations get at, you know, does it cost me on average $7, $10, whatever then I want to make the budget capable of getting an appropriate amount so I get substantial data, right? My tests aren't in vain. Um, the first things I like to test are media and headlines. Those are your, your biggest pushers. Um, you know, test images. I love image ads. Um, I know that everyone's like video, video, video. And I, we run a ton of videos. We're here making videos. Um, but I still love image ads. I, they're my favorite. I can always get them to just crush. And so I like to test the media and the headlines. The reason I like those two things is because they're the biggest levers you can pull. Um, I've had ads that were doing okay. I changed the image. They started doing well. I wrote the right headline and boom, 
Like I was, I was on a, co- I was on a consulting call the other day for this guy. And, uh, three days later, I, I, I was making some ads for him at the end just to test. Right. And I wrote this headline, um, and it, it, it you know, I, it just came off the cuff, whatever. Didn't think anything of it, sent it consulting call ended. We, three days later, he goes, dude, I, it really bothers me how that thing you put up in the past five minutes is our best performing ad we've ever had. And it's like those types of things, you never know when you're gonna write the right headline. And Dynamic Creative is a great way to find that. So that those are really the, the levers we like to focus on primarily. And then you get into secondary things like changing the button, the link description, the whatever. And you're also a master at long form creative. So you combine, because it's obviously your eye goes to the image and the headline. Like if you follow eye tracking studies, those are the two highest leverage sort of things you can change. But then once you hook them in with those things, you've got to have that yeah. ad text. That really yeah. tells the story, and that's and that's where you're this freaking unicorn, where you have this mind for for numbers, extreme, but you're also like a, a poet, I believe. Yeah, it's uh, I I I love um, my my when I first discovered the the weapon that is long form copy, I was stunned because when I had finished re- like writing it, I read what I wrote, and it was long. It was like for over four thousand characters, right? <laughs> and so yeah, that's a long ad, right? And I just it's an essay. Thinking, who is going to read this? Like <laughs> no one will care. And so I remember right there, okay, so instead of the headline just getting like their attention, what if I make the headline that is just, they're so interested, they have to know what this ad's about. And then the long form copy is there and they're like, this ad's huge, what is going on? And I kind of just was right. I, that's exactly what ended up happening. And so since then, we've been looking at that as like kind of a framework for, okay, let's structure the ad in a way that gets an engaged reader because halfway through the copy, they forget they're in an ad. They forget they're they're just relating to this person that's talking to them. And if you get, that's the best user you can get on a webinar free training. That is the best user. So um, we, yeah, we found uh, the the combination of really looking at the data and taking a very like data-driven mathematical approach to what's working and then focusing equal amount of energy in making the most persuasive, interesting, valuable content has been like, if I had to have one key to success, that would be it. I love it. And I I was going to ask that question is, you know, you've got that, you've got the image that hooks initially visually, then you've got the, the, the teaser that's sort of like that draws you further then you got the long form creative that uh, that tells the story and really, if it not seals the deal, like just really compels them along your funnel. I think that's right. such a valuable way to look at it in terms of, uh, you know, getting the maximum amount of Facebook and, and, and having it work in your funnel in the best possible way in that sort of sequential manner. Right. And um, it's that's a, a feedback loop, too, because you have to remember if Facebook is looking for meaningful metrics, time spent on post is going to be one of the biggest indicators. Right. So a long form ad, even if they don't like it, is going to give you a very high time spent on post and you're going to start winning auctions. And it seems like almost magical. Right. When in actuality, there's just a metric that you have an advantage over your competition with. Uh, so we have a question here. How many ads did you start with 15? You were saying that it totally depends on the budget you're willing to spend to. You need to be able to get a, stati- a statistically significant number of conversions uh, right. within those ad sets to justify the number of creatives. So what do you start or, with? Yeah, so like typically what I like to do is I start with I start with one body copy and I'm like, that's that's what I'm gonna, that, I'm gonna just use that. And then I'll do like two images and then three headlines and then like a lifetime budget. Let's say I'm going for webinar registrations of like 300 bucks for two weeks. And then I just let that go. I do not touch it. I do not touch it. I just let it go. I then look at the results of the breakdowns, find the combinations, find like all the different things I was seeing. And then I'll pull, say, I don't know, I'll take out an image and take out one headline and just have like a dynamic creative with the best performers, get those metrics again, and then pull them into static posts and run them at scale to keep the engagement. Nice. Very cool. So, okay, so let's get into CBO here. We ha- I've heard a lot of different things. You were saying, I heard the last person I heard talking about it was like, there's no way they're going to go ahead with their plan to, to, to only, I'm like, that doesn't sound like Facebook. I've heard, you know, some people say, no, they're not going to go ahead with it. I think if they said they're going to do it, they're going to do it. For me, it's what's working best right now uh, versus, versus ad set, but, or sorry, ad set budgets. Um, what's your take on CBO? It sounds like you're an acolyte. Yeah. So, um, I'm not, I don't discriminate, right? Like if it's a tool, I'm going to use it. I use literally everything in the business manager, like everything. I use uh, dynamic creative CBO. Um, I use reach campaigns. I use uh, video views, uh, literally pretty, I, I, pretty much every tool that they offer. I use, 
Um, I like CBO when it works. I don't like it when it doesn't. <laughs> I know that's like the dumbest way to phrase that yeah. ever. Uh, but uh, I've noticed, and, and this is something oh. I've really been noticing, is like it seems that what works from a structural standpoint is changing every two days. Sometimes CBO works best. Sometimes ad set budgets work best. I currently split test both in all of my accounts. I don't, I'm not using just one in, in any of it. And I don't care which one works first. I let the data decide and then uh, go in with that strategy. But I will always bring back the other one every you know week, something like that. Um, I just don't, I think that it's more of a market-based um, event than we, we like to admit, i.e. the more people that use CBO, um, you know, if a bunch of people shift towards it while it's working good, then probably something is going to go out of whack and it's going to start working bad. And then, you, you know, I see ad sets pick up. That's my theory. I don't know if that's, if there's any validity to it, but that's really what it feels like. Um, and so, yeah, I use, uh, typically I'll use CBO. I love it for like warm retargeting. That's like one of my favorite uses for it. I pretty much use that's like my go-to because it's such a great way to just put in like your video views, page engagers, website traffic and uh people engage with post or ad or whatever it is and you don't know which one of those audiences is going to be the best right so you put them into a cbo and then it just it always runs i found that that's the most stable way to create like something that's quote unquote evergreen and evergreen in the the, the modern facebook landscape is like a month but um <laughs> uh, you know that that's really like uh, the only thing that i've seen like achieve really good legit stability um but i i've noticed both work and uh they'll trade off usually very cool. Yeah, we're having a lot of success right now with that exact strategy of, of T CBO for, for warm stuff. We're not using dynamic product ads, though, and I think we definitely got to be giving that a go, especially because we're you know in that info space. You never know what headline is going to compel them forward. Yeah, I would, uh, man, and that's dynamic creative. Dy dynamic product's a little bit different, but dy dynamic creative, I, I could not recommend it more because, again, you're right. And it, what I love about it is it allows you to test that one headline that you probably wouldn't have, you know? You have yes. that one like that wonky headline that's like, what this this will either crush or just do terrible. You know, but with dynamic creative, it's like you can kind of throw those in there because if it does terrible right off the bat, you just kill it. You just pull it out and 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 that's it. So I think it has a lot of advantages, especially to, to like a, a creative marketer. Very cool. Uh, so what else is going on here? Like, like what is happening in your world in compliance right now? Like everyone I know, you know, the, the only constant is change, as we know, in the Facebook space. But what are you seeing, like, sort of specifically in that compliance space? Do, are you getting new kinds of shutdowns or is it, is it yes. all the traditional ones? You're getting yes. new, no. new yeah. reasons. Right. So um, I, um, I'm really good at getting uh, ad approvals reversed. Um, that's something that, like, I, I've gotten over a hundred ads uh, that were disapproved, approved in one day, like literally like a hundred disapprovals and they all got the, the decision reversed. And so um, that's something I've been, I've had a lot of success with to the point where I, I can run a little bit, like the copy is going to be maybe, you know, a little edgy, little, uh, you know, not the safest thing, um, you know, to run it from a compliance standpoint, um, but we'll still be able to get away with it. Recently though, I've noticed that compliance has been extremely aggressive. They're flagging um, things at with with seem like when when the political thing came up, I noticed a lot of ads randomly got flagged for being political that were not political at all. That were not political at all. Like mm -hmm. if you go to Dean Graziosi's page right now and you look at his info and ads, you can literally see like how much money he spent towards like political issues, and it's like him promoting a masterclass, you know. So it's yeah. like I think the immense pressure that Facebook's under to like improve their, uh, you know, they're they're struggling with user growth compared to what it was. Um, there's a lot of things that you know that, that don't look good, um, especially in the future. And I think one of the ways they're, um, you know, meeting that or at least uh, solving it from what they they believe, you know, internally will work is really cracking down on compliance. I noticed they're also cracking down hard on like the MLM work from home space. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure lots of people have gotten those. Um, yeah. And yeah, I've um, I actually got an account, an info account banned um, like last week, and that was the first time it's ever happened to me. It's ever, it never happened to me before. I was shocked. Um, and so we're working to get it back now. But there's there definitely seems to be a much more um, uh, brutal and and stiff. Like it doesn't seem to actually like even care if the content is legitimate if it raises certain what it believes are red flags. 
And that yeah. compliance standpoint seems to be a little um, harsher recently. I think, you know, we were talking about info and we were talking about gurus and things like that. And I think, I think what is probably happening there, like, I think while there is sort of an infinite market for info in a lot of ways, especially if you're able to drill down to like niche things, if you're able to drill down to niche things you can teach, but the general, Hey, here's how you, right. here's right. how you make money with, with ads. I feel right. like there is a bit of a backlash um, e among marketers. You see on any post, like, oh, oh so yeah, guru course or whatever. But I oh, bet yeah. among the general public, there's a bit of backlash coming as well. And so you're probably just getting more complaints from people that are like, yeah. you know, that have had bad yeah. experiences in that space yeah. or whatever, right? And so many people sold so many garbage courses, right? Because they saw the model work and they never stopped and thought, oh, the reason the model works is because they have a product that actually educates people gives them a real ROI on the service is an actual product and business. They're just went for the cash grab. And instead of refunding, you know, maybe they shut down their merchant processing account, you know, oh, yeah. like so many of these shady moves that a lot of these um, online gurus made have uh, caused damages. Now we're seeing it. Um, yeah. we, we, you know, I, we've even taken a shift away from a lot of the angles that have been running for a long time and created new softer angles that we're testing right now. Um, so it definitely seems like there are real changes that are materializing. That's uh, that's interesting. We have a couple questions from the uh, from the previous topic there. So uh, so you remove the bad performing headline from the active dynamic creative ad. Is that when you're talking about removing bad elements? You do it in a, like live. Yeah, a lot of people ask me about this. Um, we we do do that, and, and we we see good results when we do it right. Um, it can mess everything up, obviously, because you're pulling something out of a live um, ad. But uh, we, we, we will do that. We will also take the best performers and create a new dynamic and see how they do without the dead weight. Um, that does really well. And then we pull those uh, the best, best performer into a post and run that at scale. Um, nice. But it, I know everyone always kind of is like, you really do that when it's live? And we, we really do. I do too. I do too. Like I, I feel like Facebook is such a resilient platform overall that if you're like, if you have something that's working, like, I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm, I'm one that will just go in there, at, you know, or I, I'm not too precious about it, even like, I, cause I've never actually like, back in the day, we used to call it Lennying a campaign. Have you ever seen Of Mice and Men? Yes. Where, Le where Lenny has all those pet bunnies and like, I love yeah. you, I squeeze you, I love you, and you break it. Yeah, like, exactly. Back in the day, things were like that a lot. And I you know Facebook can be that way as well, but I don't find it too delicate. I, I feel like you can change things on the fly like that. Yeah, I, I agree. It, de it depends. It can be insanely delicate to where like you raise your budget by like 20 bucks and all your CPA goes to shit. <laughs> uh, but I think with stuff like uh, dynamic creative, um, a lot of things haven't been proven yet. A lot of things are not set in stone on how that works. And I think that those types of experimental features can be very advantageous to people who are willing to take a risk. Yeah, I agree. Okay, another question here. How do you come up with the headline? Is, is what, what we have asked here. What do, what do you do to catch the audience attention? Great question, great question. Um, so the, a lot of what I'll do about the headline, um, let's say it's an info angle. So um, one, one of the angles I'm working on my with my clients right now, um, you know, recently married and he was telling me some stories about his, you know, his now father-in-law was like ripping on him. Like when, you know, when his daughter first met him, um, you know, he, <laughs> He was like, uh, who is this guy? He, you know, he does he does some stuff on the internet. Like, yeah, I bet he's just another, you know, scam, whatever, the, what, what a lot of people say. And so um, he told me this story and right there, the headline popped into my mind. Um, why my now father-in-law thought I was a loser before I made 11 million on the internet. Boom. And I just thought, that's the headline. And then the ad, it, that's what we're going to write, you know? And so um, I think the best headlines are the ones that are, they're, they're striking, but they're not clickbait, right? They're just uh, genuinely exciting. And they come from uh, a place that like promises more, but still delivers a lot, right? Um, I know, uh, you know, the, the, one of the headlines I wrote at consulting.com was um, the death of the nine to five, right? That headline tells you nothing about what I'm selling, tells you nothing about what I'm marketing, just tells you the death of the nine to five. And so that draw that draws a lot of interest. And so finding ways to summarize your entire angle, summarize the entire benefit and phrase it in a way that causes people to kind of do the like double take, like what did I just see? Um, yeah. that's, how you, that's how you write a great headline. Yeah. Uh, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, to me, both of those things have one thing in common that is, is using things that are relatable, using relatable yes. emotions. Like yes. anyone who's married knows a father-in-law. 
that they want to to seem powerful before. And, you know, after right. your, after your second one, which just left my mind. Oh, the, the death of the nine to five. Anyone working a nine to five job feels like, exactly. is this the right way to organize? Like everyone has those feelings. Right. And so when you can, right. they know your product, they may, but they know the sensations that you're talking about. So I would say that's a really good rule of thumb as well. 100%. It's, uh, you know, I, I, that's two sides of the same coin, right? It's like, um, you know, re really relatable, valuable, punchy, attention grabbing, not clickbaity is where you want to go. Love it. Uh, Jeremy's asking how I make these great side by side videos. Shout out to BeLive.tv, uh, which is actually free for just this scale of thing. It, it works perfect. And special shout out, of course, to Tim Bird for giving me this amazing platform to reach so many people. Each of these is getting like uh, 5,000 views, basically. I'm sure most of those are very short. Uh, and we, we're getting a bunch of views on YouTube as well. But live streaming these things uh, in this group has been a game changer. So big shout out to Tim and all the amazing people in the ad buyers group. Again, you got to get into ad leagues, either gold. Start out just with gold. It's cheap, uh, but the quality difference you'll see in the conversations that are having and the mods attention are, are unbelievable. And then platinum takes you to a whole other level where you're part of this like really elite community of, of yeah. marketers yeah. Who, are, who are there to help you grow the most. Uh, it's such an amazing space uh, that we are in and we are headed to Barcelona. So this is, you know, I actually haven't really talked to you very much about what you're actually going to be talking about in Barcelona. So why don't you tell me and, and everyone else here what, what kind of stuff you're thinking about for Barcelona? Yeah, so um, I, we do, I, I do a lot of consulting sessions, right? Um, and I started noticing a lot of like the same things emerging with like all of these clients. I'm like, wow, everyone has a lot of the same problems. So um, the general theme of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, selling at every step of the funnel. Um, but really what that means is, and what I want to introduce is um, how a rock solid theoretical understanding combined with like two crucial skills can really make your um, media buying process like completely transformed. And so I want to share the processes that I've used building this agency and how we're able to have, you know, great results with a very small group of very small, efficient team. Um, based off some of the systems, processes, insights, and most importantly, that uh, theoretical framework. Um, I'm also going to talk about copywriting. It's going to be the first time I've ever like really brought the copywriting secrets to the table. Um, I had someone tell me that uh, of the they spent it was like three thousand for an hour, and they told me the five minutes we did of copywriting was worth that. That alone was worth it. Um, so I, I'm definitely excited to bring like how to make good ads and then buy them in the most efficient way, not just, and like, not just to get the row ads, but like long-term brand building, um, you know, actually real conversion rate optimization. And, uh, that's going to be all, uh, contextualized under selling at every step of the funnel. Fantastic. That's amazing. Speaking of teams, I got to give a shout out to Dino. I see he's watching this. D I know you and D I met Dino in, in Las Vegas with you there. And I think it was at that mastermind, at Tim's mastermind, you decided yeah. to partner up there. So big shout out to yeah, Dino. Yeah, that's, yeah, big shout out to Dino and big shout out to Tim. He, uh, he did get hired right after that mastermind. I like, that dude is unbelievably intelligent. Um, one of like the most natural, talented people that I've met in this industry. Um, very, very gifted. And uh, we're, we're doing some really cool things right now. I think ad leaks is worth it just for the summaries he sends out, like the I high agree. level, like summaries that you get from ad leaks. No one has time to scroll through things all day, but when you see it yep. summarized like that and special thanks to Dino for yep. doing that. Dude, okay. Thanks. That, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to wrap it up. You want to finish your point? Uh, no, I was just going to say on the ad leaks thing. Like if you just read those emails, it, it, it like literally one week out. I mean, that alone is 100% worth the money because I get tips from it all the time. Like all the time. I use stuff from that all the time. So could not agree more. And uh, shout out to Dino for always getting that done. Nice. Okay. I know we uh, we got to get back to some other things here. So basically, we're going to be in Barcelona. You guys got to come see us. You can get 25% off if you uh, go ahead and use that promo code for ad buyers, ad leaks members only. It's a crazy good deal. Plus, you get to hang out with us all in Barcelona. You get yeah, full access I, to the speakers. Unreal. That's what I'm talking about. Like honestly, the what I'm going to be talking about at Barcelona is – hands down the coolest thing I've ever talked about. I'll have more time than I've ever had to talk about it. Uh, I am like, I, I cannot wait. I know it's going to blow people's minds. And like, if you have not got a ticket, 
get a ticket. I promise what I bring on stage and off stage are so awesome. <laughs> you do not, like, you just don't want to miss it. I, I, I'm looking forward to it so much. Nice, man. Okay, well, keep cool there. Get, get back to Mark Lack. I'm going to get back to what I'm doing. And uh, it's a pleasure as always. I can't wait to hang out in Barcelona with you. Great to see you, dude. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Peace. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Another amazing episode of The Robust Marketer. This is always the favorite favorite time of my week is doing these interviews, uh, getting to get the feedback from you guys. If you have any feedback about the podcast, you want to see uh, the kind of guests. Uh, actually, I don't care about that because we're going to be doing all the speakers for Barcelona. But for future episodes, I'm going to keep doing these podcasts. Uh, so, so shout out for anyone you're looking for uh, to be interviewed. If you want to be interviewed, if you've got a great story to tell, you can reach out to me on Facebook. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we've got a few last comments here. Jordan is an ads savant. Everyone should go. You're absolutely right. I don't know if he's a savant because that, yeah, I think he's a savant, but he's, he's pretty good the rest of life generally. So I don't know if, uh, I know that's an idiot savant. He's not an idiot savant. I'm going to stop talking soon. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in today. And we'll see you uh, again next week. We've got two episodes next week. I'd have to look at my calendar to see where they are. But they're going to be fire as always. Thanks so much, guys. See you later.